Well, it's 12.01. Let's just go around the room before we turn it to Dr. Blocker. Just uh, introduce ourselves and, and where we serve. I'm Alan Latta, and I serve at a congregation called Generations Church and I'm president of the Ministerial Alliance, and we need a secretary. I'm Fred, and this is Joan. I'm the chairman or the coordinator for the Hood County Prayer Task Force. And I go to Lakeside Baptist Church, Sunday school, kindergarten Sunday school teacher. Jerry and Mickey Allen are just sitting in listening. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Welcome. Margaret Cohenauer, the Paluxy River Children's Advocacy Center. Great, welcome, welcome. And welcome to the Allens. Jerry is a mean guitar player and a realtor in town. Oh, thank you. Well, Charles Dixon is with us. He's a pastor at Faith Assembly of God. Hey, everybody. Um, I, I'm kind of multitasking here. Sorry about that. I'm Valerie Rainey, and I am retired CEF Child Evangelism Fellowship of Greater Fort Worth. Great. Well, we're delighted to have our guest, Dr. David Blocker, here. I met him last year. He was a newcomer to the county, retired from the military only to be on the front lines of the COVID battle now here in our community, and I always look forward to his weekly reports. If you don't get those, he can tell how to do that. But anyway, I encouraged him at least the first half to tell us about himself and then to launch into the COVID thing. David? Honored to have you. His nickname is Haas. Maybe you could tell us about that background as well. All right. Well, thank you, Pastor Allen. So, uh, yeah, no, I ha I'm happy. I'm happy to share. Um, I'm not at, uh, at at work today, so I'm kind of in an alternate alternate location. We're in the process of moving uh, moving between different locations in Hood County. Uh, so, uh, so moving chaos. Everyone can understand. Uh, you know, we're. As a military family, uh, my wife, my wife and I, and uh, our three kids uh, moved about 12 times during a 21-year uh, military career with the Air Force. Um, and then I finished up uh, finished up my Air Force career and uh, came here to join other family. Uh, my wife and kids were already here while I was finishing up uh, time in the Middle East. Um, but I retired here in 2018 to continue on as a uh, as a physician, as a doctor in the uh, local area. Um, part of my questions when I was meeting the medical folks and leadership around the community in the county was uh, who, who took care of public health here in Hood County. Uh, part, of my, part of my background, uh, I spent, uh, I'm a prevention and aerospace medicine uh, specialist board certified in those areas, uh, done occupational medicine and, and taking care of uh, pilots and maintenance folks and police and firefighters and folks like that my entire military career. That was, that was my military specialty. And so, you know, uh, what does a what does an Air Force flight surgeon do uh, with those skills in a community like this one um, after leaving 21 years in the military? And so, I asked who is doing public health, who is doing public and community health, looking out for those aspects of the community. And the county judge and commissioners at the time said, "Well, uh, you know, you're 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 more than qualified for the job. Doing this over 20 years, we're happy to uh, let you be our county health authority, but we don't have a budget, we don't have an office, we don't have uh, any type of resources or infrastructure." But you're more than welcome to do the job if you'd like it. So I found myself uh, found myself as a county health authority at the end of 2018, just after leaving the military. Um, I also do FAA uh, flight medicine uh, flight medical exams for the pilots around uh, around the county. I'm the only one certified to take care of our commercial pilots that live out here, um, our various communities around Hood County um, and surrounding areas, uh, and then. Um, I opened a wound care center up at, uh, up at uh, associated with Lake Granbury over there on the campus by the hospital uh, or at the start of this year and helping take care of folks with chronic uh, wounds, diabetic wounds, uh, vascular wounds, things like that. So, so although I am retire, a retired Air Force physician, um, I am far from retired as far as uh, staying busy with the various uh, work around the community. But, but again, Pastor Lada, to answer your specific question about background, um, uh, I, uh, I am related to Dan Blocker, who played Haas Cartwright on Bonanza. And so when you spend time in the military, um, everyone, especially around the aviation community, ends up with some kind of a call sign. And most of the ones for the doctors are not that flattering, right? Uh, Dr. Strange Glove and uh, Sling Blade and different things like that through the years. Uh, drug dealer has given out medications to everybody. So when, uh, when I was given the uh, military call sign of Haas, 
I locked onto that. I put it on my mugs. I put it on my name tags. I put it everywhere. And that's kind of stuck through the, through the years in my uh, medical, uh, medical professional career uh, related to, uh, related to that, that connection with, uh, with Dan Blocker. Um, but uh, my wife, Tracy, is a realtor in the area. She's also an occupational therapist by training. And so um, for years, we homeschooled the kids and then uh, shifted them over to Christian schools and then eventually public schools as they got older. So uh, she's, uh, she's continued to be involved in, uh, in uh, children's programs and support programs through the years, as well as uh, has her real estate license here in Texas now and helps uh, with the realty work around the community. We have three kids who are all, uh, are all out of the house as of the past year. Our oldest son is, uh, is an Air Force officer in his own right, stationed out in San Angelo, uh, Texas, about four hours away, three and a half hours away, uh, working uh, contracting and, and financial uh, type support. And he, he's really passionate, loves that, that kind of work. Um, our younger son, Aaron, is currently in training in Biloxi, Mississippi to be a... Um, Cyber, cyber ops and uh, combat communications guy. So radio, satellite, um, computer communications, secure communications and all that. So uh, real, real proud of him and excited for him and his, uh, his next uh, adventures there. But he's uh, currently kind of hunkered down with the storms coming through in Biloxi, Mississippi. And our youngest child, our daughter Julie, is down at UT Austin. Um, and we had a chance to spend some time with her this past weekend. Um, and uh, she's, uh, she's there going through school, uh, like so many of our students, um, you know, uh, college and, and otherwise, uh, trying to figure out what it looks like with mostly online classes and her communities and stuff. But she's studying, she's studying sustainability and how to um, help protect our environment as we continue to grow um, different, you know, resources, infrastructure, technology and like, and still protect and preserve uh, the, the, God, the world that God gave us. So uh, really, really proud of her and uh, encouraging her to lean towards uh, public health and environmental medicine as well. Um, even in high school, she was out meeting folks uh, talking about how we need to do recycling in Hood County and things like that. And I said, Julie, I work with those folks as the health authority. She said, oh, that's okay, dad. I've already talked to them. I got it, got it figured out. I don't need you. So that's kind of how my kids uh, have been, uh, you know, trained and grown and be independent and work through uh, the community on their own. But uh, we have, a, we have a strong foundation of faith in our family. Um, my, dad, uh, my dad is a minister, my mom is a teacher, um, and uh, Tracy also uh, spent, spent, uh, you know, spent most of her life growing up in a, in a church environment. And so we've raised our children, our family, to uh, serve God and serve others in all that they do as well. And so we're really proud that uh, that next generation is kind of carrying that on for, uh, for the Blocker family. So, so that's, that's a quick background so far as far as who I am, what I do, what I'm doing now in the community, kind of what my family looks like. Does that, does that suffice for that part, Pastor uh, Allen? Okay. All right. Thumbs up. Good. All right. Well, um, I want to share a little bit about the uh, work um, and, uh, and what we're doing related to coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 here in Hood County. Um, I know I've had a number of conversations, with, not just with Pastor Lada, but with other uh, other pastors and uh, ministers around the community, as I have with different other community leaders in Chamber of Commerce and uh, you know elected officials for city and the county and the like. So I'm um, always happy to share uh, perspective. Um, I think it's really, really important as we walk through coronavirus or anything else related to a public health crisis. Uh, and in this case, this is, this is a particular virus that's extremely infectious. Uh, it meets all the epidemic and pandemic um, criteria from the standpoint of World Health Organization and Centers for Disease Control and Texas Department of State Health Services and all that. Um, but I think it's important to kind of understand, you know, when, when we get into how, what, what types of actions are recommended across our various communities, um, kind of the reasons why and the underlying issues behind them. Um, Believe me, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not keen to wear a mask around outside of, you know, my, my direct medical patient care work any more than anybody else is. Um, however, you know, right now in the midst of, as we continue to walk through this, uh, this coronavirus issue, uh, you know, it, the, the best thing you can do it, if, you're, if you're trying to protect, uh, protect from something that's spread by respiratory droplets, in this case, coronavirus or influenza or other similar illnesses, well, the best thing you can do is not have people around each other when they're sick. I mean, that's the first, first thing right off the bat. If somebody's, if somebody's sick, 
and they're staying isolated at home or just with immediate folks looking out for them, well, there's no risk for them spreading anything anyway. The next piece is if you're staying more than six feet away from others on a regular basis, we have good science and, and, and information um, for decades, and that's recently been verified. And this is coronavirus crisis. I've seen uh, I've seen studies by University of Colorado and like talking about um, whether you're playing a band instrument or singing in a choir, and that applies to church choirs or, or congregational singing as well. Any type of respiratory droplets, uh, coughing, sneezing, all those things, um, but also those those other activities the majority of respiratory droplets are going to fall within a six foot radius in front of you, around you, to the side of you, above and below you, uh, for wherever you're, you're, you're breathing, coughing, singing, playing an instrument, etc. So, so again, if you're staying more than six feet away, the majority of those particles and droplets that are coming out, whatever you're doing, are going to kind of settle in that area and they're not going to immediately get onto someone else, in, you know, within a, you know, if they're not within a six foot radius. That's the second thing. Beyond that, in general public, again, as, as a doctor, as medical folks, we have a requirement to get close up on people who are uh, other people uh, who are sick or to do medical evaluations, dental evaluations, things like that. So we have a specific, you know, again, the N95 masks and respirators and other shields and things that, that we use in the course of our professional work to try to minimize risk and spread that are even more filtered. But those are even harder to breathe through than a cloth mask or a face covering. So when it comes to general public and general population, um, if, if you're concerned that people aren't going to stay home if they're sick, which is the first protection. Second, if you're concerned that people aren't going to stay six feet apart because they can't do it, they don't want to do it, they're not interested in doing it, or they're going to walk through common spaces that everybody's going to share, such as a church lobby, an entrance to a building, a common check-in area, a bathroom space, et cetera, where someone may have just coughed or sneezed in the last minute or two, and you don't even know it because you're all just walking through those, those public spaces or using those public spaces. Well, then the next layer of protection for the general public as uh, across the board is to wear some type of a mask or facial protection that primarily keeps your cough or sneeze or whatever from, from sharing to others, but it also does provide some protection from other droplets that are on the outside. Again, if you walk through that, they're gonna get on the mask and not up your nose or in your mouth, right? So, so those are really the basic, I mean, it's pretty straightforward stuff. You don't have to get super scientific to discuss some of the reasoning behind some of these recommendations across the community. But yeah, I continue to be surprised at how, how uh, some, some individuals are, get so overwhelmed or so concerned about the fact that ain't nobody going to tell me to wear no mask and do what I want to do, et cetera. Well, that's fine. That's your right. That's your personal right. But your personal right does not trump everybody else's rights around you whether they're the folks who are going to church with you, the folks who are going to Walmart or, or, uh, or any other place of business or, you know, official or otherwise, going to a movie, recreational activity, et cetera. So, so that's really kind of the science behind uh, or the, the reasoning behind these kind of standard recommendations we have across the community. Um, uh, Pastor Lada, you, you mentioned the regular reports. I, I try to put out one report a week. I've got one right now I'm trying to finalize to get out for this week. Um, I do these reports um, in between my other medical work. Um, as I've mentioned, I, I have one volunteer who, who has supported me for about 20 hours a week over the last couple of months, which has really been helpful when we've had hundreds of uh, dozens of new cases up to 150 active cases or so coming in each week. Now we're down uh, around, you know, 25 to 40 cases of the last couple of weeks that are active um, uh, coming in that we need to track and follow up. But beyond that, I, and I'm losing that assistant, it's, it's, it's me. And it's the county emergency management folks who are, you know, one too deep to deal with all emergency issues, all emergency plans, all responses, you know, including, you know, fire emergencies, uh, concerns about chemical plants or, or, or uh, trains going through uh, that might have some kind of problem, uh, na other natural disasters, fires, uh, floods, et cetera. So, so there's a lot of things on the county officials' plates that are, are uh, you know, not, not just coronavirus related. And so then, you know, again, I volunteer my time and support as best I can, but really it's a collaborative process. It's a partnership process with those elected officials, um, the, the other folks who are, who, the handful of folks who are hired to do some of these jobs, and then, um, and then collaborative with the doctors uh, and other medical folks around the community um, and the state uh, in this uh, local region. Our local hospital, who uh, you know, deals with the brunt of any type of emergency um, concerns or hospitalizations for coronavirus, regardless of where people live, because that's the other important piece. The statistics that that you know we track and report for Hood County 
relate to Hood County residents. There's no guarantee that someone's going to get sick in Hood County. Uh, and there's no guarantee that someone who gets sick in Hood County lives in Hood County. So again, we've had deaths in the hospital from folks, you know, as far away as the Houston area or, or other places that happened to be visiting or had family that were here. Um, and yet those, those numbers, that information doesn't go on our statistics. Those go on the statistics of that person's home county. By the same token, if someone who happens to live in Hood County gets sick while they're traveling or gets sick and gets sent, say, to Harris uh, you know, Hospital in Fort Worth, which is a very common occurrence for seriously ill individuals, well, if they pass away or have a bad outcome or get tested positive, they're in you know, Fort Worth, Harris, Harris Hospital, what have you. Those statistics do eventually come back to Hood County. I just don't necessarily have as much information as I do on the folks who, who are being treated and tested here, either at Lake Granbury Medical Center or our, our local uh, medical clinics. Um, just simply because there's so much going through the state. The official reporting location for all coronavirus, influenza, um, whooping cough, other, other childhood reportable diseases, sexually transmitted illnesses, all that stuff, all those official reports go through the state of Texas, go through our regional office in Arlington. They cover 49 counties. Uh, they have the huge counties like, like Tarrant County and, and Dallas and like that have you know, hundreds and hundreds of people who are always on staff to do public health programs. And then they support counties like ours that might have a doctor like myself who is actually trained and experienced in this, or they might have a doctor who's deputized, who happens to be one of the doctors at the local hospital, who's never had any kind of public health training background experience like I do, but yet they are the go-to person for that county right now. And the, so the state has to support 49 counties just from this, this immediate region. And so the, my point is that when information comes and goes from the state, as far as those official reports go, there may be a lag, there may be a delay of, of days or sometimes a week or more before that information comes back to us on someone who was tested for coronavirus or who had a death or something outside of the county. And I may only end up with limited information uh, depending on where it happened, where it went through and, and what information filtered through the state and back to me. So those are some of the challenges on the local tracking, local reporting. What I can tell you is if I put it in my local report, which are on the Hood County webpage, uh, which are on the uh, City of Granbury webpage, as well as some helpful graphics that kind of show the breakout of cases by age, uh, cases by transmission um, state, if we know that, um, i.e., you know, family transmission, work transmission, um, just community spread, which is the majority of our cases, over 50% are just, we don't know how they got coronavirus at this point, community spread. But all that information is, is posted as I am able to update and verify and validate every single case um, that we put on our report um, on the city uh, webpage and on the county uh, county webpage. On occasion, things will get in the Hood County News, as you mentioned, Pastor Lada. On occasion, things will be picked up by um, you know some of the larger networks uh, in uh, across Dallas Fort Worth if they think it's an interesting case uh, as far as rural uh, rural impacts. But however, the you can always see whatever I have reported and validated, and that's really important because again. We have to deconflict lists that come back from the state. We have to deconflict lists that come from surrounding counties and send our information to the state and to surrounding counties to try to make sure we account for it so that we don't, for instance, have someone that's double, double tracked. Maybe a teacher or a student um, was uh, reported positive at part of uh, one of our school districts. And so we get a report from them that they sent these folks home and they're testing other folks in the class and help with contact tracing. Well, um, I want to make sure that I don't count that case twice because again, I may or may not get a report a day or two later from the actual testing location that says, here's the, here's the positive test for that person that Cranberry ISD already notified me of. And so I'm constantly, we're, we're constantly having to deconflict those. So that one individual doesn't get counted multiple times on the list. Right. Uh, so anyway, so those are some of the challenges behind all of this. Um, quick, I'll touch quickly on the current statistics that I have from last week. As I told you, I'm working a report now. And then I'll stop talking and open it up for questions because uh, I find that's the most helpful way to share information with any group. So uh, we had 932 total cases in Hood County as of last week. Um, we have a 8% positive test rate. Um, and that's really important when you talk about recent tests, how many, how many tested positive, how many tested negative. Um, we, we're, we're really looking at uh, if, that's, if that's around 10% or lower Lower than 10%, we, we, it looks like you know, our transmission rate is, is on the decline. If you have more than a 10% positive test rate, 
that means that you're having a lot of active spread and a lot of folks are coming back with positive tests. Now, of course, those test rates can be biased by the fact that, for instance, we've sent folks back to school. Anyone with any symptoms that was a student has been tested over the last month for coronavirus, whereas over the summer, they may not have gotten a test, whether they were sick or not, because it didn't really matter. Now, we are artificially creating more tests and more requirements to test, and guess what? You know, we have 18 to 25 percent of those local cases over the last few weeks have been in school age groups because simply because we're testing them right now, whereas before they, they weren't necessarily tested. Um, so you always have to look at that kind of testing bias. If I test you, I'm more likely to have a positive result. I'm also, I also have more tests to account for and, and, and collate and go through. Um, we have had a total of actually 20 COVID positive deaths now in our community. We had another one over the weekend. Um, that's been some, some folks have had a lot of concerns about how that stuff is reported. And there's been some, some inaccurate, even national coverage on some of this stuff. Um, I want y'all to understand that coronavirus is reported every and tracked every week, rolled up from the local level to the regional level to the state level, and eventually up to the Centers for Disease Control um, in Atlanta across the nation. Uh, across the nation, the CDC tracks influenza-like illnesses every week, even when it's not flu season. We happen to be entering flu season now, so folks are more interested. But every week of the year, the CDC gets a roll-up report of influenza-like illness. Well, guess what? Coronavirus is an influenza-like illness and that is respiratory spread. It can make people very, very sick, um, overwhelm uh, their systems with pneumonia primarily, and so respiratory failure, uh, cardiac failure, other organ failure related to those types of pneumonia-like symptoms, those are influenza-like illnesses. So that stuff is tracked every week from the state and through CDC, and those reports are out there every week. Uh, during this coronavirus pandemic, it's interesting as news media and others have gotten more interested in what's out there anyway, they take a piece of the data and they run away with it because they don't really understand it. Um, and so a couple of weeks ago, I had to address stuff with our state representatives and our county leadership and, and city leadership and everything else about, oh my gosh, people, only 6% of the coronavirus reported deaths, which now we're sitting close to 200,000 across the state, um, uh, excuse me, 200,000 across the, across the U.S. But uh, anyway, only 2%, 6% uh, of those deaths are actually caused by coronavirus because all the others, 94% had something else listed on the death certificate. Well, absolutely. As a doctor, the way death certificates work is you list the immediate cause of death, i.e. the person's heart stopped. They stopped breathing. That was why they died. And then you list all the other supporting factors. They died because they stopped breathing because they had pneumonia-like illness. They happened to be, they were positive for coronavirus when they had that pneumonia. They were positive for influenza or something else when they had that, that septic shock or that, that other cause of death. So, so what happens is you end up with four or five different things on a death certificate, and coronavirus is gonna be one of those, those supporting uh, indications for, for death. If the only thing on the death certificate is coronavirus, the person who wrote the death certificate messed up because you didn't die of coronavirus, you died of complications from that illness or that infection, right? So anyway, I, I, I take a moment to share that because there's been a lot of kind of kind of self-generated silliness that's out there um, where people take something and run with it on the internet or forward an email and don't really understand what's going on. And so uh, again, I'm happy to, to talk about that more if needed, but had a total of 20, 20 COVID positive deaths. Out of those 20 COVID positive deaths, 17 of the 20 were, were COVID related um, based on my reviews of the medical records and the available uh, information provided to me on those 20 cases. Again, uh, pneumonia, overwhelmed uh, system, uh, you know, due to complications of being ill and acutely ill con contributed to by, by coronavirus illness. Three of those others had other stuff going on and they were tested positive at the time of death. Uh, one was a heart attack, for instance. Person had a heart attack, they happened to test positive coronavirus, but they weren't actively sick at the time. They weren't actively ill at the time. I don't consider that a coronavirus caused death or related death. They just happened to have coronavirus when they had the heart attack because they weren't otherwise sick. Um, one person had cancer and was overwhelmed and, and, and died from cancer complications. Could that have, I mean, they were also positive for coronavirus at the time of death, but they weren't, didn't have respiratory type symptoms. So could that, you know, their system partially overwhelmed due to coronavirus? Absolutely. But I could not see a direct link between the direct cause and mechanism of death and the fact that they happen to be coronavirus positive. So that's kind of how that works. 
uh, 20 coronavirus uh, positive deaths, uh, 17 of those were coronavirus uh, related uh, because of the symptoms at the time of death. Um, we still have uh, swabs and tests that are going out there. I kind of mentioned that uh, the cases, uh, school age and, and otherwise, most of our cases are in adults. Um, however, uh, about 18% as of last week were in school aged uh, uh, school age folks. Uh, and uh, again, I already kind of explained the reason for that. And if someone is tested, they are sent home. They're isolated uh, away from others. Um, if that involves other other children in the home or other family members, then the recommendation is that they all isolate because you can't say they have, they have effectively stayed apart from one another. Um, outside of that, if it's a work contact or if it's somebody who happened to be on the bus or happened to be in the same classroom, then it really depends. How much time do those folks spend close to each other and were they wearing masks or not? If everybody's wearing a mask and they're not physically ill at the time, again, they're not, they're not coming to school coughing and sneezing all into their mask and wiping it all over the immediate location, well, then I'm not really concerned about that person spreading coronavirus if they weren't actively having symptoms and if they were all wearing masks for the reasons we talked about. If they aren't wearing masks, if they're sneezing on each other or sharing lunch together, well, then all bets are off, then they probably all need to be isolated. And that's my best advice and recommendations uh, for any school, any workplace, any church, et cetera, when it comes to those activities. Um, okay, I think, that's, I think that's enough as far as the statistics and the reasoning behind it. Um, I want to open it up for questions from the group, and there may be something that y'all have a very big concern about that I just haven't happened to talk about yet or need me to clarify. Uh, David? Uh, Fred Orcutt here. Um, Hi, Fred. Two things. One, I noticed you've got MPH after your name. Is that miles per hour so we can call you Speedy or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can if you'd like. Uh, we'll add that nickname. The MPH is Master in Public Health, and uh, part, of, part of my medical training included, um, as I mentioned, I'm board certified in preventive medicine and aerospace medicine. Um, I spent a year um, at the University of Texas, in addition to my, my uh, doctor studies, spent a year uh, uh, earning that Master in Public Health, where we spent a lot of time on these community health issues, population health issues, environmental medicine, uh, things like that, that uh, is kind of this subset that deals with not just taking care of one person at a time, but taking care of an entire population, so whether it's infectious disease or uh, food and waterborne illness, uh, you know, uh, air quality, soil quality, um, exposure to chemicals, things like that. Okay. Um, ask you a more serious question. Uh, I understand you're a doctor and you're concerned with health, and so that the advice you give is to maximize people's health. Uh, Suppose you changed hats and you were the mayor or the county commissioner or the governor or even the president. Uh, you have to take other factors into account just besides health. If you were one of those guys, would you make different recommendations at this point in time? Uh, here in Hood County or for the state or for the nation? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with Hood County. This is the okay. community where we live and work together. Right. And uh, no, no, you know, I don't know if that's a fair question to ask me because everything, you know, my whole adult life has been framed from a medical perspective, but also from an operational perspective, right? Um, as a military doctor, my entire career, I have made my best medical recommendations to general officers, senior military leaders, commanders of troops that, that you know, are having to make decisions about, is this person safe to get on the plane and fly or to, to do their job, uh, you know, in a harsh environment where bullets are flying or they're exposed to, uh, you know, environmental conditions and things that we wouldn't normally be exposed to at home. And, uh, you know, make the best recommendation. Does this person meet the criteria to safely do their job or to be in that environment? And if they and if they don't, I I call it what it is from a medical standpoint. And then the commander can rule or, or or overrule me at any time. They can say, "Got it, doc. I understand the guy's arm is broken. I understand the guy's got one leg, and and he's missing an eye. But by golly, he can still carry a weapon, and he's gonna go and he's gonna go to the front lines to fight that battle. And that's the commander's decision. My role is to provide the best medical advice that I can." to that commander or to that, that mayor or to that governor or what have you. And then they've got to make the best decision operationally for, hey, what, I understand, thanks doc, but this is what we're going to do. And then you salute smartly and support that. Um, that's exactly what I've done for our community, for you know our county and our city. 
you know, they make the best decisions as far as, hey, are we going to be open 100% or 50% or 25% or whatever? And we spend a lot of time discussing these things. Are we going to have a 4th of July parade or not? We'll make the best call we can locally. And then like the next day or sometimes hours later, we get hit with a governor's, governor's order that says, guess what? You are or are not doing that. Or you're, you know, now you're going to be, you know, only open so, so much percentage anyway. Or you are going to wear masks because it's a governor's mandate, et cetera. And all those those orders from the governor's level carry the force of law um, under under Texas health code and public health law, you know, and that's again, that's part of what, you know, what I, I've studied as, as well as, you know, best done my best to advise our community leadership. So at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if you completely agree with it or not. If it's a legal thing, then, you know, then we have a, a responsibility in, in our society to follow the law, whether we agree with it or not, or whether we like it or not. Now, there's a lot of other room for, for individual, individual activity interpretation. Individual businesses, you know, have some degree of flexibility as long as they meet the governor's orders of what percentage to be open or what have you. They can decide whether or not they choose to enforce the rule of folks wearing masks in their, in their business or not. And here's the other thing. As individuals, we all have the right to decide whether to do our business there or not, whether to go to Walmart if the person next to me is not wearing a mask or is wearing a mask, whether to go to that restaurant if I feel like the, the, the person next to me is or is not following the rules as we're coming and going for the doors and the bathroom, and I, I choose to give my business there or not. The challenge is, um, you know, on top of that, we do have, again, health code and food sanitation codes and things that say right now, hey, those servers in the restaurant, those workers behind the counter making your food, they have to wear a mask. And we can enforce that and we can require that because that deals with public health and safety. As far as your individual choice to wear a mask or not, or follow that when you come and go from whatever activity, if it's a if it's a if it's a private business, if it's your private home, if it's a it's a family gathering or community gathering outside of those official rules, well, there's guidance there, there's guidelines there from the state. But you as an individual and as a family and as a group can decide how much credence you want to give to that or not. And then you you walk with that risk, right? So this is really about risk mitigation and risk communication. First, is there an actual risk? And do I agree that that's a risk? Whether it's coronavirus or flu or walking into a manhole if the manhole's not covered. I mean, you name it, you, you do that risk mitigation decision. And then, and then you know, you have to layer that on as far as, okay, who else might be impacted by that decision? Am I responsible for a community group such as a church, right? My decisions may impact others who may have, may have a, a positive or negative outcome. Again, keep it information. So, so, so let me take a step back. I am all for businesses being open, churches being open, restaurants being open, parks and schools being open. I, I highly encourage that because I think it's important for us to have as normal a life as we can and not live in fear, okay? So if we have that awareness of, hey, what is the risk? What, is, what are the concerns from a public health official standpoint? So, so we have that knowledge and information when we make that decision, whether I'm a county official or whether I'm a, a minister at a church, then from my perspective, I, I've done my job in informing and, and helping you to, you know, helping to advise you. You've got to make your best decision as an individual, as a family, as a community, how to execute that. Again, it's more challenging with schools because we say kids have to be in school. And so therefore we have Texas guidelines, state guidelines, we have Texas educational um, association guidelines that, that get into the specifics of different sports activities and things like that, as well as classroom. And and there are certain organizations that have to follow that. There are public and, I mean, our, our private and charter schools that are highly recommended to consider those things um, as they continue on in school. But again, everybody has the right to decide if they're gonna be at a public school versus a charter school or a private school or homeschool during this time. And we support that. So I know I didn't specifically answer your question, uh, Fred, but I don't really think I can. I, I intentionally um, have chosen not to run for office. I don't wanna be the mayor. I don't want to be a city councilman. I don't want to be any of that stuff. Uh, you know, I, I find I, I serve the community best um, with, based upon my experience and my, my chosen profession in this advisory role. And I, and I try to stick to that lane. Thank you. I so appreciate the weekly reports. Out of all those numbers, what's the one that should be priority in our minds as we make judgments as leaders? I think two, I think two numbers, and there's been some more revisit on this from the, from the CDC and from the state, even just this week. And that talks about kind of your case positive, uh, positive testing rates and how many active cases we have in the community. Uh, we're, a, we're a small county. 
we got you know about 65,000 people or so based on on the initial kind of census estimates. I've heard some people say we're as much as 80,000, but I, I got to go off the U.S. Census Bureau and the official numbers. So about 65,000 people, 40 active cases as of last week. That's really pretty darn good in a community of 65,000 people. And it just boils down to where are those 40 cases? Like I said, are they in school? Are they in very, you know, working in various businesses? Are they in our nursing homes and elder facilities, elder care and living facilities where we continue to have a lot of concerns in our community since we have so many people that are in those age groups and, and that have those additional risk factors due to age, due to other medical conditions and things that they where no matter what they get sick of, if they get sick, they're gonna be, they have a lot of risk of being really, really sick, hospitalized for a bad outcome. So the numbers are those, those total number of active cases in the community and that, that current positive, uh, positive test rate. As I said, it's about, it's about 8% as of last week. I don't know what the numbers are yet today. 8% positive test rate and 40 active cases in our community. Um, back in July, August, we had as many as, uh, as about 160 active cases at one point in time. So as you see, that's a quarter of that. Um, all things considered, we're doing really well at this point. Um, and the numbers are trending down across Texas.